Acaba Pueblo, about an hour's drive west of Albuquerque, is known for its Sky City Village and rich culture and traditions. Acoma is also one of many tribes that have sought in recent years to have sacred objects that were removed without permission returned home. Last year, Senator Martin Heinrich introduced the Safeguard Tribal Objects of Patrimony or STOP Act. That legislation would prohibit the export of sacred objects, but not everyone agrees on the best way to address this issue, and the conversation seems to be changing. Tribal leaders, attorneys, and arts dealers met this week in Santa Fe for a unique conversation about repatriating sacred objects. After the meeting, correspondent Antonio Gonzalez sat down in studio with some of those participants. Tribal officials, attorneys, dealers and collectors, and the general public met this week in Santa Fe, New Mexico to discuss understanding cultural items and had an open dialogue to talk about how to return sacred items home to tribes. So I have three guests with me today who were at that meeting and um, joining me now is Aaron Sims, who is an attorney from Acoma Pueblo and Dallin Maybe, who is with the Southwestern Association for Indian Arts, who is Northern Arapaho and Seneca, and also Robert Gallegos, who is a board member, a New Mexican, and you are uh, with Atada. Thank you for joining us. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. So Aaron, um, Acoma Pueblo has been instrumental in work to bring sacred items home, in particular with the item in a Paris auction house. After the conversations this week, how do you see the role of tribes when it comes to the return of items? Well, I think it's a, a number of things in, in the efforts by ACMA, uh to, to bring forward this issue, I think, uh, uh, came as, as a result of a number of tribes, I think, having um, similar kinds of items uh, of importance to them uh, being auctioned. And so moving forward from uh, where things stand now, uh, I think that uh, what the last uh, two days of uh, conversations that have taken place represents um, uh, for as a challenge for tribes is uh, to begin to engage in in this kind of dialogue with uh, uh, willing participants who come to the table from uh, the art side, the the collectors, and so there for for tribes it's a, a number of things in terms of meeting, engaging, but also. Um, I think looking to their own communities to see where uh, things can be strengthened in terms of uh, their own tribal laws or their own uh, kind of self-advocacy in, in looking uh, to, to identify those kinds of things that are important to their communities uh, and, and working to uh, bring them home on a number of levels. Um, and so uh, ACMA as an example uh, moving forward will uh, be engaging at, at all levels, working with federal legislation. The past couple legislative sessions, the Pueblo has supported uh, state legislation uh, to address this issue, but also looking at what they can do internally. Um, so there's a number of issues, I think, uh, and challenges that we have moving forward, but um, I think we're, we're eager to, to see what we can do moving, in, moving into the future. So what was the message then from the tribal's perspective to the artists, or excuse me, to the um, dealers and collectors at this meeting this week from the tribal perspective? I think one of the, the important perspectives that, uh, that tribes are trying to relay um, is, is in terms of balancing kind of this uh, uh, inequity in the conversation that takes place. Uh, the way the um, statutory framework for uh, tribes uh, to be able to uh, use as vehicles to claim back some of these items um, really places a, a significant burden on tribes um, in requiring them to um, provide information uh, that at times might be extremely sensitive to communities and uh, in many cases uh, against the law within a certain tribal community say if a, a tribe makes a claim on, a, on an item, um, sometimes as an example, um, uh, the, the questions might come back of uh, what was the item used for? How do you know that it was um, taken out of um, under uh, malicious pretenses? And so for, for tribes, it was uh, in this conversation of trying to explain um, that we're the experts within our own communities. Uh, we're the experts of our own culture and we understand within our own frameworks as tribal governments um, how these items might uh, fit uh, in a legal structure within our own communities. And so our claim to them uh, should be sufficient. Uh, 
it should be sufficient for you to to understand that it's sensitive um, and that within the context of uh, uh, of our communities that um, the way that they're kept or held uh, or the 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 legal nature so to speak is something that there shouldn't be that need for for further uh, inappropriate maybe questioning from, from tribal perspectives. And Robert, um, Aaron talked a little bit about what the tribal role is. So what's the role when it comes to sacred items, in particular the sale, when it comes to dealers and collectors, the community? I think there is a, uh, a new awareness within our community that has to be established and it's based on the right of self-determination of all peoples to determine what's important to themselves. And in the past, Aaron is absolutely right, many of the laws were without any indigenous or any native input. So it's hard for a lot of us that collected legally under those misinformed laws. And so we have to readjust our thinking. And so we are, as an organization, we made a big commitment yesterday by demanding that our membership does not deal in very specific items that we listed that we have learned from conversations with Native communities. Uh, we will not ask for privilege information, the religious privilege information, and we will defer and try to conform to their decisions. It's, it's their property. That's a big uh, job. It's uh, a very radical thinking. Our organization will lose, me lose membership because of this. But I think in the bigger picture, we will gain more membership because it is the right thing to do. And more people actually perceive this move by us as uh, maybe now they want to join a, a Tata. And there's some disagreement between tribes and the organization when it comes to the federal legislation to stop the export of cultural items. Um, your group is working on voluntary returns. What, what is the main reason for opposing federal legislation? Well, it's really probably not that complicated. And, and the, and the issues that we have trouble with is <clears throat> when you go to regulate this STOP Act, you put the custom agents in charge of determining what cultural property is. And only the native communities know that. And that being the case, <clears throat> even within the communities, only special people that have that special training to receive that information can make those decisions. So it appears to us that things that the custom people have to make decisions on, they're not going to be able to do it. It's hard for us to know when there are no written tribal cultural policies. We have a hard time knowing exactly what uh, is prohibited. I mean, there are some obvious things, but there's things that are not so obvious. So it's a matter of due process of letting us know exactly what is prohibited. It's a little subjective, but we are going to do everything to support the law because my sense of the STOP Act is needed because the disrespect that the French government gave our native communities was, was a bad example and they based it on the fact that we had no current law governing such things. And they didn't recognize the sovereignty of these nations. They didn't recognize the religious claims. So we have to get it passed. It's just a matter of we want to make sure this law works for the Native Americans. We do not want these things to go into court because I'm not sure it will favor either side. And um, Dallin, you come with a wide range of experience as an artist, as someone who works with um, 
uh, all these artists here in the Southwest with your organization, also just a traditional cultural practitioner. And can you talk a little bit about the importance of it? So the general public listening to this, we're not talking about contemporary art, something you're gonna go on Santa Fe Plaza and pick up, but something that's either um, part of history, archeology span that was dug up and looted, or maybe even just somehow an item that got removed from the tribe that wasn't supposed to. So can you talk about just um, what happens when it's such an item leaves? Absolutely, so I'm highly encouraged that Atata took the steps that they did to engage in conversations that are very difficult and complicated because they're replete with emotion and ties to our senses of traditions and ceremonies and, and ultimately our cultural identity. Whereas uh, for those well-intentioned collectors, you know, they admire the culture, they want to surround themselves with native art and native beauty, and they feel drawn perhaps in a way to some of these objects. Um, so conversations like these, despite the difficulties, are absolutely necessary, and I'm not sure they could have taken place 20 or 30 or 40 years ago, um, but they are now, and so we're working uh, hopefully as tribal communities and as uh, collectors and dealers in a positive way that will allow all of us to overcome some of that fear of, uh, you know, what comes next. And so the symposium had a, a big focus on the STOP Act, which essentially is, is proposed legislation to help prevent the exportation of cultural patrimony or religious and sacred objects uh, from our communities and into a larger international market for Native American antiquities. Um, so as, as a community member, uh, I think what we overwhelmingly heard this week was that uh, our value structures are often different. The sense of, of value that we place on these, these objects are um, immeasurable in a lot of ways. Um, for many tribes, some of these objects came to life um, because creator or grandfather or man above or however you call him uh, wanted to bless our communities in some ways. We have protocols for taking care of them. We have ceremonies that uh, utilize some of these uh, beings in order to help us understand our place in the world. And so when we see these things leaving our communities um, in a variety of different ways, um, it's, it's uh, very emotional. It's, it'd be like uh, selling off your child or a relative or uh, something of immeasurable value um, because of the sense that we hold um, for their place within our communities to just simply bless our lives. And so as... Um, we move forward in the conversation. We all tried to engage in um, understanding, first of all, that we all come from a position of respect and, and um, in, in our approaches towards addressing this, this issue. Um, and I don't doubt that uh, um, Atata is well-intentioned. I trust some of their board members. I know them um, from the art community, uh, apart from their roles at Atata, and, and I believe what they say. Um, obviously, we have differences about the mechanisms of something like this proposed legislation and how it would alleviate some of that fear. Uh, but I do believe um, that there is a responsibility on the part of dealers and collectors as well as tribes to simply use uh, the Stop Act legislation as the foundation for these mechanisms. Tribes can create um, the ability for uh, collectors and dealers to understand not necessarily what these objects are, uh, but at least know of the sense uh, and importance that they have to us. Um, dealers and collectors hopefully will begin to engage with tribes and say, hey, I've got something that I'm not quite sure about. Can you just let me know if this is okay? Maybe there's a certification process that has to happen prior to the export process, so we don't have uneducated immigration officers simply seizing, uh, uh, or customs officers rather, seizing objects and saying, hey, I'm not sure about this. Um, I, I, so I do believe that uh, if we can get a jump 
on the process itself, I think we can find compromises in which tribes will be comfortable, uh, collectors and dealers will be comfortable. Um, we can sort of stop the, um, the inequities that have happened in the past from even getting to that point. And um, is there any future symposiums planned at this point? Well, <clears throat> the key to this is, is education, informing uh, non-natives of native worldviews. And so there is going to be future efforts, and particularly uh, encouraging and continuing with our voluntary return program. And that program uh, is based on the right of self-determination and the rights of the natives. So regardless of what the law protects us from, permits us to do or not to do, we are going to listen to the tribal elders. And we're going to have to figure out how to get these two cultures together because it's somewhat uncomfortable sometimes. But I think there's ways to do that because in the end, for instance, we were hoping to get a donation policy for those that do make contributions to get a fair market value deduction. Valuing a sacred item is very offensive to Native people. So if we can come up with something that they don't have to deal with the valuation, just the acknowledgement that it was received, and the other community can get that uh, deduction, then I would see a tremendous amount of important material coming back to the, to the, to the communities. And so sometimes we have to look at the greater good. And in my mind, the greater good is that these things go back home. Well, it sounds like open dialogue is going to continue between hopefully the tribes and the uh, dealer and collector community. I want to thank you all for being with us today, and hopefully we can revisit this soon in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.